70 years ago today, North Korea invaded South Korea, backed by Soviet and Chinese forces, sparking three years of war that tore the country apart, split it in two, and began decades of division for the Korean people as the war never ended. The active fighting only stopped because of a ceasefire, leading to this uneasy state of coexistence of the South and North, a tragic legacy of the Cold War that ended for major world powers, but for which Koreans still have to face the consequences. Today, we reflect upon this fateful day that divided the Korean nation in its 5,000 years of history. We have joining us today Kim Young-jun, Professor of National Security Affairs at Korea National Defense University, who is a member of the National Security Advisory Board to the South Korean President. We also connect with Suzy Kim, Professor of Korean History at Rutgers University. Well, my first question to Young Jun. Let's begin with how this war broke out. I mean, it wasn't supposed to end like this. After liberation from Japan's oppressive rule over the nation in 1945, what were the major factors that led to the division of the Korean people 70 years ago? Actually, we have the, uh, the both factor. I think that the Professor Suji Kim is also uh, specializing in this uh, topic. And uh, we have the uh, internal factor like the uh, political power struggle, uh, including the political figures, Sung Man Lee, Kim Gu, Yeon Young, and Park Kwon Young, and Kim Il Sung as well. And then also we have a lot of the civil war uh, factor, including a land reform issue, pro-Japanese collaboration issue, especially from the already 30 years ago when the uh, Japanese colonization had began. And also we have the uh, external factor, of course, of the Cold War, a uh, division of Korea is uh, uh, sponsored by the United States and Soviet Union, and also Soviet Union uh, also developed atomic bomb, uh, and um, uh, the U.S. administration the, uh, uh, the, uh, created the National Security Act in 1947. This kind of uh, both uh, internal and external factor influence on the uh, uh, origin of the Cold War, and also uh, the Korean War already began in not just the uh, 1950, but the uh, 1948 because of hundreds of thousands of uh, Korean people already died, including the Jeju uh, incident and the Ayosu uh, Suncheon rebellion incident. So we have already a uh, uh, massive casualty uh, before the uh, June of 1950. So uh, we, we, we can say the Korean War already began in 1948. So really a, a string of domestic and external factors contributed to the um, outbreak of, active outbreak of war on that day. Well, Susie, active fighting um, stopped in 1953 with the ceasefire agreement. Why did it have to end in a stalemate? And could things have been different had it not been for the uh, vested interests of foreign powers? Well, I think uh, Dr. Young Jun Kim covered a lot of this ground, but in some ways the stalemate of the armistice or the fact that the war was inconclusive, you can trace those factors exactly back to the, the legacies of the colonial period and also the legacies of the Cold War that had already begun before the, the Korean War. So in other words, um, Korea was divided completely, um, not by its own fault, um, by the Allied powers, um, with the U.S. occupying the South and the Soviet Union occupying the North. But of course, they needed to come to an agreement in order to um, form a unified Korean government. But there was already a stalemate um, between those negotiations that led to eventually this, uh, the foundation of the two separate states in 1948. So I think in many ways, the stalemate of the war reflected earlier stale stalemates emanating out of the Cold War. Um, and I think it's also important to remember there were, st there were stalemates uh, during the war itself. So in other words, there were stalemates repeatedly in terms of negotiations that would ultimately lead to the armistice. Um, in other words, the war had already more or less uh, come to a stalemate in mid-1951. There was very little movement in the battlefront after that time. And in the meantime, for two whole years after that uh, midpoint in 1951, as the armistice negotiations dragged on, there was indiscriminate bombing of North Korea that led to a very traumatic um, memory for the North Koreans to this day. And I think the, one of the reasons why there is such an emphasis on ending the Korean War from the North Korean side is precisely that really harrowing experience of the, the two-year 
um, uh, um, bombing campaign that was equivalent to uh, 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 a complete wipeout of many of the facilities in North Korea, as well as um, numerous millions of deaths of civilians in North Korea as well. So Starma continued throughout the war and it exists even to this day and well, Yongjun, South Korea since then it's made great leaps in democracy and now stands for individual freedom and civic participation and we are now in our sixth republic but North Korea still remains under the iron grip of the Kim family dynasty and as you point out in your book uh, in North Korea the military has shaped the identity the identity and culture of the wider North Korean society. So how did this military state develop? Yes, it's a lot of the uh, factor shape in the uh, uh, North Korean education state or military state. Uh, as already Professor Suji Kim pointed out, uh, North Korea has a lot of this uh, civilian casualty. Uh, some historian argue the more bombing uh, on the North Korea rather than the uh, bombing in Germany because of the kind of uh, some, time, some kind of racism or some kind of uh, weapon test as well. So North Korean civilian has a lot of the uh, casualty and especially for the last two years, a period of the, the Korean War. So Kim Il-sung used this kind of uh, post-traumatic disorder among North Korean in shaping uh, garrison state, especially large military uh, uh, soldiers uh, even today. And also, uh, interestingly, uh, from my research the, uh, uh, during the pre-Korean War period, especially from 19. Uh, 48 to 1950, uh, the Korean People's Army was an uh, interesting uh, icon of a new national identity, new Korea, uh, also symbol of a modernization, just like the uh, Americanization of South Korea. Sovietization of North Korea is kind of an icon of a modernization. Kim Sung used this kind of image of the Korean People's Army in making uh, North Korean people proud of their own. Uh, a national uh, soldier, also a powerful uh, army in defending their own uh, new Korea. So this kind of a diverse uh, factor in shaping on the uh, military state, and still today, uh, the Kim Jong Un uh, especially changed a lot of the uh, his national strategy. But still, the North Korea has the largest uh, military forces in North Korea. Well, of course, we can't forget the provocations that came from North Korea's side uh, to South Korea. I mean, the sinking of the naval ship in, t in recent years and also the downing of a Korean uh, air flight and things like that. Well, Susie, um, are the differences between the two Koreas now too great to uh, come to reconciliation now? Well, I think that depends on the perspective. I mean, this is a very difficult question um, that in some respects is about kind of thinking about the future and the progress of the peace process in Korea, as opposed to looking back as historians are more comfortable doing, like myself. But um, having visited both North and South Korea as a Korean American um, person, I guess I would say, I mean, there are definitely differences, no doubt about that, because of the long history of separation and the very different political systems. But having said that, you know, the, the fact that it shares a much longer history um, as a united country, the fact that it shares culture, the fact that it shares language. Um, I think in some respects, you know, you could also focus on the similarities um, as a way to overcome some of those, those differences um, as, a, as a legacy forward. And so I think it's, it's really important as a matter of perspective, what are your priorities in terms of moving forward? Do you want to focus on the differences or do you want to focus on the similarities? And I should also emphasize as someone um, that really believes in the importance of diversity um, and appreciating diversity that I, I don't think um, differences are something to be afraid of um, or to be feared um, or to, to banish, but that we should actually think about ways to incorporate to, to appreciate the differences as a way to reconcile the two Koreas and the, this very long history of division. Well, well, Yongjun, formally ending the Korean War was one of the biggest issues discussed during the inter-Korean summits and the US-North Korea summit in 2018 and 2019. And we have lived in the state of impasse for seven decades. And while well, ending war is inextricably tied to politics and ideology. So do you think it uh, should and could be pursued as a non-partisan agenda? 
Yeah, yeah, we still have hope. Yeah, so every day now, say, uh, uh, worldwide, yeah, uh, world news media are focused on uh, the Korean Peninsula, especially uh, Kim Yo Jong's speech and the uh, another uh, uh, possible provocation. But we still have hope, and uh, we we can uh, develop the kind of the uh, uh, civilian exchange, you know, like the uh, the local school exchange students or uh, more like the uh, individual trip to North Korea and not as a group because of sanction. So we can have a more, uh, make the opportunity to exchange it uh, both uh, Korean. So we made the kind of uh, image of North Korea as a evil, but it, it was not true. Uh, even though uh, North Korea has a dictatorship, but they have uh, ordinary people uh, to living in their uh, everyday life, just like the Professor Suji Kim already pointed out he, in her excellent book. So we need to understand a uh, real North Korea by exchanging a uh, human being rather than just uh, blaming uh, some dictatorship of a political regime. So we can make a kind of a, uh, the, the civilian human being exchange, especially younger people. Uh, between both Korea also international committee. Uh, one interesting example will be uh, uh, North Korean scientists uh, or uh, engineer student can study in the Ivy League or uh, like Stanford or even New Jersey State University like the Professor uh, Suji Kim uh, teach and they can have a postgraduate study in the U.S. and um, maybe the U.S. Uh, uh, sponsor scholarship for this kind of uh, non-political uh, topic issue of a graduate student of North Korea. So it, it could be a very good start uh, of the uh, exchange of ordinary North Korean real people uh, between international community and North Korea. So promoting more civilian exchanges and promoting understanding as well. Well, I'd like to hear this from both of you before we go. Um, well, the Korean War is often called the Forgotten War, but what do you want people to remember as we go forward and as the two Koreas try to, um, try to amend their ties? Uh, let's hear from you first, uh, Susie. Well, so, you know, the, as you pointed out, the Korean War is unfortunately known as the Forgotten War largely in the United States when it was such an important part of American history. Um, but what I've noticed in this very important anniversary of the 70 year anniversary of this official start of that war is the amount of attention paid, I guess, to the veterans. And, and I do not mean to minimize in any way the, the sacrifices, the enormous sacrifices that the veterans have made in, in all of the different countries um, that participated in that war. There's no doubt um, a lot of heroic attempts, I guess, by, by, by the participants of that war. But I also, I guess, want to emphasize the forgotten people of that forgotten war, which I think are largely the civilians. Um, with modern warfare, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, with the devastating indiscriminate bombings, I think the vast majority of the casualties of these war tend to be civilian. I think some estimates um, say that maybe perhaps as much as 80% of the casualties of the Korean War, for example, were civilians. And we need to remember the pain, the suffering, and the many millions of separated families that resulted as a result of that war. Um, and I think it's um, absolutely important for us to remember that pain, precisely not to repeat the same mistakes, of engaging in war as opposed to negotiation and compromise and engagement. And I think it's uh, it behooves us, those that are surviving and are in positions of that can make any difference now, to actually do something in order to address the grievances that remain so that families can actually come together. So as you said, not to minimize the pain of those who are in the front lines and who are in action, but also the lives of ordinary people that were that were inevitably impacted by this devastating war. Well, Yongjun, what would you like people to remember about this so-called forgotten war in going forwards? Uh, from my research, maybe uh, same point of view, when I researched in North Korean capture document, also Professor Suji Kim uh, dig it in, in the College Park and Maryland. Uh, when I found the very interesting sources like the uh, letters and diary of a personal level of uh, the Korean People's Army soldier, uh, especially most of uh, the soldiers are very young people, especially poor children of the uh, uh, pigeon family. Uh, they just the, uh, uh, thought about the KPA as a job in feeding their family. 
because of, uh, they are very poor. So even the uh, uh, most of the high-ranking officials of the KP uh, has a political ambition and a very strong uh, ideology of communism. But um, most of the uh, young uh, Korean people's army soldiers has uh, their own dream in, in, in uh, making a world mobility opportunity for their family. So, uh, for example, we need to understand the uh, 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 real people, ordinary people of forgotten North Korean people, civilian. This is a great start in understanding uh, rather than just a thought about the revenge or hatred uh, because of from the war. Now it's the 70 years anniversary of the Korean. We still have a, a lot of hatred or revenge feeling of that Korean among South Korean people, especially elder generation, which is understandable. But now we need more like healing, uh, the making memory uh, uh, of, of uh, understanding uh, uh, forgotten civilian, especially uh, focusing on uh, including uh, young Korean uh, Korean people's army soldiers as well. Well, as you both said, although the uh, Cold War has ended, the impact is still living on, and the Koreans are still living out this proxy war. And well, hopefully, this period of tension will be short-lived in the course of South. Um, of Korea's 5,000 year history. Well, we'll have to wrap up the discussion here, but thank you both uh, very much. Uh, Yong Jun Kim, professor at, professor at Korea National Defense University, and Susie Kim, associate professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey. This is also where we wrap up the show. Thank you for watching.